僕がいなくても自重してくださいね健康に良くないですよ酒は人類の友だぞ友人を見捨てられるか人間は So the other day a friend of mine sent me this article titled Science says toxic masculinity more than alcohol leads to sexual assault and well obviously I was fascinated I wanted to investigate the validity of that claim is toxic masculinity more to blame for sexual aggression and violence than consumption of humanity's good old friend There's a lot of questions that might immediately come to your mind. For example, how does this author describe or define toxic masculinity, and how were they measuring alcohol use? There's a lot to get in there, friends, and being the turbo autismo that I am, I went in and read nigh a hundred studies to see if there was any veracity to this initial claim. And the answers might just surprise you. I mean, they won't, actually, probably not. But let's go on this scientific adventure together anyway! Into the magical and mystical world of the incredibly fun topic of date rape. What is this? I didn't order this. For you. For them. Oh. What are you doing, man? It's not safe. Anything could have been in there. Nice try! So, as we delve deep, Into this very sensual and sexual topic, where do we begin? How do we study date rape? The short answer is not easily. As I've discussed many times, there are obvious ethical quandaries which prevent us from ever studying something that is very potentially psychologically harmful, such as this phenomenon through direct experimentation. For the same reason, we can't take a bunch of African Americans, put them in a hospital, and then subject them to the syphilis bacterium. We similarly cannot put a bunch of men and women into a room and give them a couple of bottles of powerful grain alcohol, and then carefully sit in the corner behind a bush, watching and collecting field notes to count all the potentially consensual and non consensual sexual encounters that occur in its wake. At least, not in the name of science. We can't. When it comes to human subjects, there's a lot of rules when it comes to ethical violations. We can't do anything that we could reasonably expect or predict would cause serious negative outcomes. As such, we have to use proxy variables or correlational evidence. But given the indirect necessity of this study, we need to also assess a lot of the problems that come up with this kind of operationalization. Beginning first with the problems and the data present from mere correlational results. So, sure, we can correlate alcoholism or alcohol abuse or being locked up for the night due to being in the drunk tank with a propensity for conviction of rape. And even though most legal cases of rape are thrown out for lack of evidence alone, and that is in and of itself a major obstacle for this entire examination, another problem arises in that this type of analysis will always struggle to account for extraneous or potentially confounding variables. Alcoholism and sexual violence might co vary it, but that doesn't mean that one is responsible for the other in a causal fashion. An example I mention quite frequently is the fact, and it is a fact, that ice cream sales increase as violent crime increases. Does that somehow mean that ice cream is responsible for violence? Of course not. And instead, the agitating heat tends to be the common variable in the popularity of frozen treats and violent streets. Instead, what we've got here is a confounding variable. That variable being temperature or heat. When it's hotter, people are more likely to buy ice cream. And they're also more likely to commit violent crime because of the incredibly intense nature of that heat causing them to become agitated. But because of the potential for confounding variables like heat in this particular instance, means that it is always going to be difficult to completely separate all factors that lead into one factor compared to another when we do this very basic level correlational analysis. Let's get a little bit more specific and assess alcoholism or drinking. Does someone drink and become an alcoholic because they are impoverished, or are they impoverished because they drink too much and became an alcoholic? Think of all of the factors that we know lead towards a higher propensity towards alcoholism, such as family history, upbringing, a tough childhood, life experiences, mental health issues. All of these can affect one's proclivity to become an alcoholic, making one descriptor like alcoholism somewhat useless if we're Trying to create a correlation with behavioral outcomes without using other proxy variables and experimentation in order to try and explain major trends in the general population. 
But despite that, it doesn't mean we shouldn't look at the correlational level data. For example, why Albrassen, Lumen, and Anderson 2000 found that convicted violent sexual offenders were more likely to have alcohol problems than sexual nonviolent offenders, with rapists and child sexual abusers being far more likely to be alcoholics than perpetrators of other sexual crimes. In contrast, multiple studies have found no correlation between higher alcohol abuse in offenders of sexual violent crimes versus sexual nonviolent crimes. That is, people who engage in nonviolent sex crimes, such as exhibitionism, are as likely to abuse alcohol, if not more so, and many other drugs as well, as violent sexual offenders, such as pedophiles or perpetrators of incestual assault. As previous analysis from Langevin and Lang 1998 indicates, Similarly, they found that aggressive sex offenders were less likely to experience some of the extreme outcomes of alcohol abuse, such as blacking out or having friends and family point out a potential problem. Is your brother drunk? I had to get up pretty early to get drunk by one o'clock. <laughs> As it turns out, she had gotten up early and had taken pain medication because of a hangover-related headache. However, she mistook the drowsy eye alcohol warning for a winking eye alcohol suggestion. Exhibitionists in this study were the most likely to abuse alcohol, and in contrast, aggressive offenders were significantly more likely to partake of the devil's lettuce than criminals of other sex crimes. A meta-analysis of 191 correlational studies from Tharp et al. 2012 further found that alcohol addiction was significantly related to sexual violence in adults, but interestingly, not in adolescents. And while there is the potential caveat that yes, adolescents are not legally able to procure alcohol, we all know how effective that is. But based, again, just on these simple correlation level data, there is some decent amount of research on sexual crimes and alcohol consumption as being a potentially confounding variable, yes, but also a factor in understanding sex crime. But because we can't get at it through these correlational level results, we need to use proxy variables since we can't experiment directly, given it's, you know, nigh unfathomably unethical. <laughs> And since we can't take a bunch of people, put them in a glass box, get them real blitz, and observe the propensity of sexual aggression that occurs between them... You kiss me, Chris! Kiss me! And since mere correlations are wrought with the potential for confounds and potentially obfuscating any apparent connection between alcohol and sexual aggression, we have to find another way of measuring it, which plenty of scientists have done in a variety of methods. So let's take out our media richness scale here and we'll start uh, from the lowest. The one blowing the lowest, I suppose, in this on the BAC scale. That was a terrible joke. We're starting with low media richness. That is, text-based experimentation. <laughs> Norris and colleagues used written vignettes of date rape stories across studies spanning over a decade. In some of their seminal, pun absolutely intended in this case, asked men and women, to whom the researchers gave a few drinks their own, to read a spicy fanfic about a couple, Justine and George, doing the dirty deed and coming to fruition, with the only difference in the stories being whether or not the characters had become intoxicated before engaging in sexual intercourse. Readers were asked how likely they would be to behave in a similar manner to the characters in the story. Both sexes were significantly less likely to associate with the fictional characters when they themselves were not a little bit shit-faced. But women, interestingly reported, being much more likely to behave in a similar fashion to the woman in the story when both she, the reader, and the story character had imbibed. Perhaps more of interest to today's video, is the association that this study assessed between hypermasculinity and the self-association. Using Mosher and Serkern's hypermasculinity scale, which can be seen here, while some of the items can be reasonably defined as machismo, such as I like fast cars, others are grotesque and irrational, such as cock teasers should be raped, and it also includes fairly typical measures of what I would call natural and normative male competitiveness, such as I fight to win. So keep that in mind when we discuss this hypermasculinity scale. But based on its use, men who scored higher on that hypermasculinity instrument were less likely to describe the story that they read as rape and were more likely to think that the woman who was involved in the story enjoyed it. 
they were also more likely to report themselves as acting similarly to the man in the story, and generally found the entire situation to be more socially acceptable than men who scored lower in hypermasculinity. It is interesting to note that men high in hypermasculinity were generally unaffected by alcohol in terms of their perceptions of how deviant the woman was behaving in the story, but rather, Men low in hypermasculinity, who had been given some of humanity's best friend, that sweet nectar of fermentation, viewed the sexually assertive female as very deviant from typical and normative female behavior. While those same people lower in hypermasculinity were sober, they viewed her actions as less aberrant. In other words, the people most affected by alcohol seem to be the less aggressive, I suppose you could use the term beta males. It's oft said that alcohol is something of a truth serum, displacing the outward placations that we make with our polite sensibilities, with the true depths of our inner beliefs. And therefore, is it not possible then, that when the liquor is talking, people display their true beliefs, often quite oppositional to the sober manifestations of political correctness that they espouse. These things have a way of working themselves out. I'm gonna let the liquor do the thinking. Have a drink. In other words, is it not possible, if not very likely, that it's not hypermasculinity that has anything to do with this trend, if there is such a thing, but rather men who say on the outside that they are feminists and hold on the inside that women shouldn't be acting sexually? Is it a possibility that these kind of beta orbiter guys truly find sexually active women repulsive for a logical mating or evolutionary reason? They potentially want to be with this woman, and when they're given a little bit of liquid courage, they drop the her body, her choice narrative, and they become disgusted by seeing a woman engage in sex with another man. It wouldn't be the first time we'd seen something like this. That maybe, when they get a few in them, then they'll tell you what they really think about these thoughts. Oh boy, do you guys already see how I'm about to take the conclusions reached by this original article that I proposed? Uh, and turn it on its head, as I am oft want to do. Just buckle up, Homestuck, because we're going in raw. Oh shit, I shouldn't have said that in a video about date rape. But maybe, just maybe, it's not toxic masculinity, but rather, I don't know, a subjugation or perceived subjugation to gynocentrism and anti-maleness that is more to blame for any of the possible effects of alcohol on date rape that we have seen so far. Stay tuned. Let's get back to hypermasculinity and test another study from the aforementioned scientists in the Norris et al. cohort. In 1999, they had men read a story about a woman, Heather, who either goes to the gym and drinks some mineral water, or goes to the bar and drinks some wine, alongside a male character who then proceeds in engaging in some aggressive sexual behavior with her, with the woman being depicted as either liking or despising the sexual interaction. This study only included male participants, and similarly to the above, the participants were given a couple of drinks and asked about their perceptions of the Heather character. In line with what we've already seen, men who scored higher in hypermasculinity were less affected by the hooch, with men lower in hypermasculinity viewing Heather as more upset and angry regardless of whether or not she expressed pleasure or displeasure, or whether or not she had been drinking. The men who had not had a drink were generally the least likely to view Heather as being upset, regardless of their own masculinity levels. But an interesting finding occurs in the drunk dudes, high in masculinity, in that they were very unlikely to report Heather as actually having been upset when she did display signs of displeasure or distress with little to no change in the displeasure condition in those who received an alcohol placebo or no alcohol at all. So again, while you can draw your own conclusions, I would say that mostly this sort of wealth of data indicates that the biggest changes still occur from the consumption of alcohol rather than something that you could call toxic masculinity. If anything, masculinity seems to be a mitigating factor. And while there's a ton of research from Norris and her colleagues, I'll cover only a few more studies before I briefly explain my qualms with all of these methodologies. I think you guys can guess what I'm going to say are some problems with the research here. Another study from Norris et al. 2002, for example, did some pretty cool stuff. And by cool, I guess it's sort of in the morbid sense because uh, it's not very fun. Anyway, in this study, men read a similar story, but this time the woman strongly resists the sexual advances of her sexual partner, eventually conceding to his coercion while reacting neutrally to the acts, a sort of deadpan reaction. 
Using a hierarchical regression, the researchers found that enjoying the read and expecting for the story to head into a sexual direction was negatively related to perceptions of force upon the woman, similarly to being given alcohol. Specifically, men who enjoyed what they read were slightly less likely to perceive the interaction as potentially rapey than if they didn't enjoy it and had just been given some booze and told to read the same tale. Interestingly, those who were both expecting the sexy times to incur and were sipping on that hard shit were actually less likely to report acting similarly to the man in the scenario. The variable with the largest effect in acting similarly to the man in the story when he was aggressive was instead the perception that the woman was enjoying the experience. Now, if you are coming from the perspective that date rape is more related to toxic masculinity, to some kind of aspect of manness that is more potent than the effects of a mind altering drug, you might uh, take this finding and say, well, here you go, there is the evidence. But let's think about what these findings actually mean and the potential problems that are incurred by this type of methodology. First, what the findings that the Norris et al. 2002 data indicate is not so much that alcohol is less related to personal sexual aggression than is toxic masculinity, but rather that when men read this particular story and thought that the woman was enjoying the act, they were also more likely to report acting similarly to the man in the story. That means that being knackered was a slightly weaker prediction, yes, but there are a lot of concerns that I have with this methodology. First, it's asking men how they would react to being in an imaginary situation, which is, hey, by the way, pro tip, not a good way of measuring actual behavior. And secondly, as with the previous research from Norris and her cohort, it is relying upon text, which is low in media richness. And considering that human emotion tends to be, you know, high in richness, yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical. Well, in a way, text allows for the maximization of personal input on the meaning of a story. In order to make it very clear about your intentions, it lacks nonverbal cues. And as such, it removes all of the ambiguity from the story and potentially separates it from perceptions that are more nuanced, visceral, or real in nature when we consider how we typically act with people, or even how we perceive other types of media that show human nonverbal interaction. Thus, Marx, Gross, uh, those are their names, not how I feel about Karl Marx, and Jerkins 1997 were interested in token resistance, which is a belief that is supposedly held mostly by men, but also by this gal, in that women sometimes feign disinterest in sexual behavior because they desire that behavior. Obviously, outside of some weird kind of proclivities, generally speaking, when a woman says no, she means no. But it's the truth, there are times when women can play hard to get. That's what these researchers call perceived token resistance. So keep in mind that when I say that, we're essentially referring to tee hee, don't hit on me, you silly boys. By the way, super hot men do this too, just saying. But in a series of studies, including the 1997 piece, Marx and cohorts got participants real fugged up and had them listen to a recording of a couple's makeout sesh. Half of the participants were told that the said fictional couple had engaged in some pretty heavy petting on previous occasions. That's the perceived token resistance condition. And the other half were given no background information about the couple at all. Over the six minute recording, the man escalates from asking to have sex to threats against the woman to outright violence while the woman moves from declining to ultimately pleading and crying. The male participants were asked to push a button when the fictional boyfriend in the scenario should stop his advances. And in a shocking turn of events, response time was slower in men who were served alcohol. It's almost like alcohol reduces response time, guys. Julian! I don't know where I felt like I could get a little drink around. Here, do you, bud? Do you see how sometimes they try to spin research in a way that they know will probably lead to the conclusion that they want without necessarily telling you why? Well, now I'm telling you why. It's because alcohol leads to decreased response time. There was an interesting effect in that men who were told they had been given booze but had really been given a placebo, really kind of a jerk move, I would say, had a decreased response time as well. It was not as much as those who had actually been given the alcohol, but it was a slower response time than those who were sober. 
Thus, we can already see another thread of this concept of toxic masculinity as being more influential than alcohol on decision making originating here. But this effect was only the case in the placebo group, not in men who thought they hadn't been given alcohol. My immediate response to reading the study is, well, yeah, you told them that they were going to get a reward and get them drunk for free, and then you denied them the liqueur. So, no duh, they were in a bad mood. I mean, God knows I would be miffed if I ordered a margarita and only got a glass of water. But much more importantly, there's the potential that this placebo effect of having expected to have a reduced reaction time created, oh, I don't know, a placebo effect. I don't know about you guys. That's cute. I remember when I had my first beer. I remember a specific instance in college where I thought that I got completely tankered on what turned out to be non-alcoholic margarita mix. So we have to ask, is this placebo effect because men have this secret deep hatred of women that they only feel comfortable expressing when they're drunk, or because of the placebo effect of a slower response in anticipation of expecting to be drunk, resulting in slower reaction times? There's no alcohol in these. There's the I confirmed it when I first arrived. There were a lot of DUIs last year, so in reaction to that, they no longer serve alcohol here. Huh? So what made us drunk? The atmosphere of this place? Men with a slower response to stopping the recording were more likely to report having previously been in a relationship that involved pseudo-sexual intimacy, wherein they ultimately did end up having sex with their partner. All that really says, though, to me is that the men might just be a little bit more dominant or maybe just even more confident. Nothing about these data are related to sexual assault, only that men who paused a little bit longer before stopping were also more successful by their own report of having sex with women that they were dating or at least courting. So obviously, I have a lot of questions here. From this same group of researchers, very interestingly, at least to me and potentially to you, dear viewer, is that they may have found some additional evidence that male feminists are a bit more predatory than their non-feminist counterparts. Coming here from Marx, Gross, and Adams, 1999. Considering the flaws we've already discussed with research using the written stuff and here with the audio research, and keeping that in mind, the researchers this time asked men about their own coercive propensities, which are measured using the Sexual Experience Survey from Goss, Giddish, and Winchiski, 1987, which involves using psychological pressure, alcohol, or drugs, or a position of authority to obtain dead precious pussy. It's important to note that respondents only had to answer one question considered to be coercive according to this scale to be included as a coercive male in the participants that were assessed. But what is considered coercive? Well, it's precisely these items. Telling lies, threatening to end a relationship, threatening to spread rumors, making promises, and pressuring the woman verbally, criticizing her sexuality or attractiveness, or even just getting angry in order to obtain sex. In other words, if you got angry because you couldn't have sex with your girlfriend, then you would have been considered a coercive male. So did coercive males take longer to say that it was time to stop during this pretty spicy situation and interaction? Like we might expect of those dirty, toxic male bastards? Well, not entirely. While coercive men were slightly more likely to take a little bit longer to push the stop button, whether they were given alcohol or not, the longest latency occurred in the non-coercive males who knew they had been given some of the liquid courage, who waited the longest before smashing the pass on smashing. The so-called coercive males had a similar response time whether or not they were given alcohol, regardless of their belief that they had been getting drunk. Call the dice to see if I'm getting drunk! <sighs> yeah, you are! Are there any girls there? Yeah! Some more interesting data from the Marx and Gross constituencies seen here in Gross at all 2001 using the same audio of the date rate scenario. Sure got your bang for your buck on this one now, didn't ya? Pun intended. <laughs> indicated that intoxicated male participants were more prone to view the woman in the audio scenario as willing than the sober men. But that propensity decreased over time. Much as with the previous data from this cohort, it seems fairly consistent that alcohol itself has more of an effect on sexual behavior or perceptions than anything else. More so than even if you think you're getting blitzed. 
there seems to be some significant evidence that alcohol is the most important factor, if we could point to any factor, than anything else. But we must be more thorough. One last point I have to make in the series of experiments coming from the Marx and Gross constituency that you may have potentially caught on by now is that, as with the writings, the audio recordings, when it comes to their value as a proxy variable for determining whether or not someone would engage in date rape, is pretty weak. I mentioned media richness theory, which posits that media load and richness, such as text, tends to be convenient for conveying precise information or instructions, but it lacks that nuance that higher media richness media does, particularly such as face-to-face -face interaction. While sure, audio is a bit of a step up from written language, how much more can be said with a wink than with a memo or even an audio recording, particularly when it comes to sexual interaction? Oftentimes, getting laid is all about that body language. So does body language play a role when it comes to alcohol and perceptions? Let's finally progress to visual experiments. For some answers, we can look to Johnson Knoll and Sutter Hernandez, 2000, who examined the effects of alcohol on male sexual aggression towards women and perceptions of the onus of responsibility for said acts. Young adult male participants were given 75 milligrams of Everclear, and in the medium get em rep condition, only 33 milligrams of the old D, while other participants were given tonic and told it was alcoholic, and in the final group just being given water and told it was water. <laughs> These male participants were then shown one of two videos of a couple on a blind date. In one clip, the woman acted reserved and physically distant from her date, while in the other, she was friendly. She touches the man's arm numerous times. And then they were asked if they thought that the man in the video should try to have sex with the girl, including trying to use force and to put themselves in the male's position and imagine if they themselves would try to have sex with her. Again, remember that thing about how trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes is bad methods, but were also asked about her personal responsibility for any potentiality that she would have been forced into the sexual act. And what do you know, alcohol affected perception and reaction time to the greatest degree once again. It turns out that, well, so far, I'm not seeing much evidence that toxic masculinity is even in any way involved here. In fact, all of the research that involves masculinity shows that it's low masculine men who are the most likely to be affected by alcohol and to view women in their inebriated state as somehow disparate. But more research using video stimuli comes from Noel et al. 2009 in their analysis of external cues as well as direct ones from the woman. In the videos shown to participants in this study, a woman, Jen, brings home a man from a bar, changes into some short shorts and a t-shirt to get more comfortable, with the only differences between the two experimental versions of the video being shown to male participants being the accoutrement of her apartment, which sends some unique potential subtle messages. In one version of the video, she is wearing a rape crisis nonprofit t-shirt, has a bunch of books on women's studies and feminist posters on her wall, and while in the other video, she is wearing a plain white t-shirt with a bunch of posters of cats and books on animal behavior. If we expect that teaching men not to rape would have some sort of effect on the propensity of men to, you know, not rape, then wouldn't we think that men who are shown these kinds of feminist signals would be the most likely to avoid any kind of sexual aggression? Hang on a tick. While drunk men high in sexual dominance were the most likely to support that the couple continue in their sexual behaviors with feminist cues being displayed on the walls and across the apartment, interestingly, the runner-up to that same behavior being masculine sober sirs without the feminist cues, the third place went to low dominance men who were both drunk and saw no feminist messages. That alone, the finding placed together could mean a heck of a lot, but let's then go into some of the personal responses before we make any more speculations. With a second question in the survey asking if the man himself would continue to pursue sexual behavior were he to be in a similar situation as the man in the story. Sober, more dominant men said they would go further with a girl without the feminist signaling, but only slightly more than drunk dominant males who said that they would do similarly with the feminist but with the low dominance men again coming in a pretty hard third place of being drunk and not having feminist cues. 
It seems that feminism can turn on dudes in some kind of weird tsundere fashion here. Now, again, I would note that this study is now 10 years old, meaning that the data were collected probably 12 years ago. So I'm not sure if that would be true today, but it is an interesting finding, wouldn't you say? Yet, does it still provide any evidence for the contention that toxic masculinity, more than anything else, leads to date rape? No, not really. Again, alcohol led to generally higher propensity to support continual sexual interaction with the woman in the Noel at all 2009 study. Kind of. As low masculinity men, while cool with the fictional character continuing to engage in sexual relations, reported that they themselves would rarely do the same when the woman had feminist symbols displayed in her apartment. The major findings that we keep seeing across all of this research is not about high masculine men, really manly dudes. They tend to be generally unaffected both by alcohol and by anything else on their perceptions of women across all of these forms of experimental research, be it text or audio or visual. In contrast, though, men low in measures of masculinity do tend to have a, a, a pretty more significant degree of being affected by alcohol. But let's keep going. Abby et al. 2009 conducted similar research having participants watch a video where a college-aged couple, Mike and Lisa, hang out while having some drinks. Then they go back home and begin to become sexually intimate before the video fades to black. The entirely male participants in this study were asked about their previous behavior persuading women into engaging in sexual intercourse. As you might expect, men who had previously committed some type of sexual assault, by their own report, felt more justified in convincing women to have unprotected sex. But it is important to note that while hostile males were the most affected by alcohol in this study, in their justification of attempts to coerce women into sex, alcohol was again the most important factor, with misperceptions of sexual intent of the woman in the video being the most related to use of coercive strategies only in those who had consumed the white lightning. Again, we're seeing that alcohol tends to be the really determining factor. There is so far no support for the claims made by the article I began with. And I'm telling you all of this because it's more or less the same rationale that has been drawn by writers who supposedly have read all of the studies I just described in that article. Yet they themselves came to different conclusions, that alcohol is less influential to date rape than toxic masculinity. But as we've seen, as I've illustrated, shown to you, with the data, with the outputs, that that's not the case. It's not the hypermasculine, the dominant men who are so affected by the booze. They tend to be generally unaffected by it at all. They tend to stay towards this middling level. In contrast, it's the low masculine men who tend to be highly affected by alcohol in a particularly negative direction when it comes to their opinions towards women. It seems to me that the people most likely to engage in some struggle snuggling are going to be the guys who are low in masculinity, not high in masculinity, and also drunk. But of course, another thing to consider in this research I've just described using video evidence is that it still has a lot of the laboratory setting involved in it and therefore will always be subject to some potential confounds. Things such as pro-social answering and acquiescence bias and as such, it probably doesn't accurately assess reality more than any of the lower media richness research does. Maybe a little bit more, but it's still got some problems. But why have I spent all of this time describing all of this crap to you? Because I want to make it very clear that I read a bunch of this research, yet I did read every single study that was cited in the original article, and I can still come to a completely different conclusion to the author of the original journalistic piece. And that just goes to show how science can often be, eh, kind of warped into saying whatever the hell you want it to say. While I would say that the initial article does a pretty good job of reviewing a lot of the research and seems to agree that alcohol is more important than anything we could call toxic masculinity for about 80% of its little running time, it ultimately falls upon one single study to conclude that no, it's toxic masculinity and not alcohol that is more responsible for date rape. And that kind of makes this particularly annoying to me because I can tell that the person who wrote this article at least skimmed the abstracts of most of these studies, even if they didn't go into the nitty gritty. But the fact that you take one study and say that it overrides the other ones somehow, 
I'm honestly perplexed. I'm not sure if it's stupidity or narrative, but either way, it's not a good thing to publish. This is the study that they use to contradict everything that I and the writer of this article has just stated. It's Salazar et al. 2014. Well, they had some of their young male participants complete a web course on sexual assault and consent, and while collecting information on their previous self-reports of sexual coercion, then retested them, a couple months later, on their beliefs regarding consent and their behavior. Astonishingly, they found that you can teach men not to rape. <laughs> Except no, they didn't. <laughs> Okay, sometimes, guys, I have to think to myself whether or not the person writing an article is really stupid or being intentionally R-worded. Because I would think that if you're any kind of science writer, you would understand what a practice effect is. But maybe you don't. Clearly, people who wrote this article you're citing didn't, or they at least hoped you didn't. In short, some men were given a course about how rape is bad, okay, then they were asked about their past behaviors, then six months later they were retested, asked about their opinions towards rape and sexual violence, and their memory of the things that they had been taught during the previous course they had been given, and asked about any instances in the interim in which they had intervened in a potential case of rape. Looking just at their findings, the men who were given this course, this anti-rape course, generally did not experience any more empathy for rape victims, nor for date rape victims. But there was, by their own report, a minor decrease in rape myth acceptance and sexually aggressive male behavior. After six months, participants were analyzed again, as I said, and respondents who had been given the course reported being generally less likely to have perpetuated any sexual aggression, as well as being more likely to have reported sexual violence on the parts of others in the time since they had taken this online course. There is more to this, though, in that Thompson et al. 2015 found that men were less likely to express intentions to engage in sexual violence against women after having been taught about it in college. So is it true that teaching men not to rape works and that all sexual violence is more due to toxic masculinity, which we can teach away, than alcohol and drug abuse? No, not from this. In research, there are a potential million different pitfalls that any of us could be subject to, but one big one we need to worry about here and in any type of testing methods is something called a practice effect, which describes the likelihood that when people are given the same test twice, it can cause that person, that participant, to become better at answering the question consistently. Not because they believe in a thing, but because they have had practice. Yes, we can randomize the questions, we can even reverse code them, but over the course of six months, we have to be very clear. These couple of papers are the crux of the claims made by this article, that men who were forced to take a class about why rape is bad, MK, okay, were more likely to be able to repeat the rhetoric that rape is bad, MK, okay, after six months. We've also talked before about something called acquiescence bias, in that oftentimes a participant, given that they are sitting there with a person in a lab coat, will just say whatever they think the researcher wants or whatever is politically correct or expedient. They won't give their true responses. We don't even have enough information about these studies. And, and I was really, really close to emailing some of these researchers, but uh, I think you could imagine what the response from them would be if... The fact is that this does not necessarily have anything to do with behavior. This is bad methods. As I have described, I have seen no evidence that alcohol is in some way less responsible for any of these behavioral acts or these personal qualities, except perhaps low masculinity in men. If anything, the wealth of the research in this field of study indicates not so much that it's toxic masculinity that has a negative and extensive effect on behavior of men regarding sexual aggression towards women, which we still have no causal data for and never will, but moreover, that what actually has an effect is alcohol upon low masculine men. The extent of this information only really shows that masculinity has a negative relationship with sexual violence. And in fact, as with everything, the thing that makes me more irritated is when I recognize you as an intelligent human being, and I know that you did some Tom Dickery to try and obfuscate the truth. That's what makes me irritated, Maggie.
So, with this going on as long as it has, let's get into my final critiques of this entire area of research. Ultimately, there are a lot of things to consider here. First of all, if you haven't noticed, almost all of these studies have been concerned with male participants reacting towards women, without any female participants being involved at all. In fact, there was only one study I cited today, the first one, that even had female participants. The rest have been solely focused on men. Why is that a problem? Well, it removes the female perspective. And it doesn't consider the potentiality or propensity for females to engage in sexual misconduct against their male counterparts. I would ask, please conduct a study similar to many of these mentioned above, wherein women get blasted and are exposed to some sort of media, you know, like... Oh, hi, honey. I didn't hear you come in. Wow. Have you done something to your hair? <sighs> Have you lost weight? No, don't tell me. Is that a new dress? And see to what point women would consider not going forward with a sexual encounter with a man while she was drunk. Is it going to be at the point of him saying, as in the Marx et al. studies, hold me and kiss me, which was considered one of the last points in the violent section of the audio? Or would it be even further or less? I don't know because you won't do this research. What about this? At what point would women, sober or intoxicated, be turned off by a man that she is totally into if he is disinterested and expresses disinterest in her own sexual advances? Where's the data on gay or lesbian forceful sexual action? Lesbian relationships have been shown to be kind of rife with some major issues regarding domestic violence. And yes, if you want to get into all of this intersectionality crap, then you have to look at those before you can make a giant and sweeping observation about an entire gender wherein you take one study and say it is definitive. When I see articles like this, I can't help but read all of their cited research. And never having read the research on date rape before, I was kind of astonished at what I found. I rarely come across data with such oppositional findings to what we are told that it's supposed to say. But this is why it is so important that we read all of this stuff for ourselves, and I encourage all of you to take a look at the description below and read all of these studies if you feel so inclined to make sure that I'm saying what I think I'm saying and that I'm not misrepresenting these data in any way. I probably don't agree politically with any of the scientists who published this stuff, but that has nothing to do with data. From what I can tell, the evidence, be it correlational or experimental across all of the studies we looked at, provides absolutely no rationale for the statement and proclamation that toxic masculinity is to blame more so for the horrible sexual assaults that do occur in this country and across the world over alcohol abuse, as that original article postulates. I honestly feel some second-hand embarrassment as it seems that the writer of this article, Maggie Coerth Baker, did read some of this research, but yet didn't read anything beyond the abstracts, and therefore came up with a very confused conclusion. Well, you can make up your own mind, and I fully support and hope that you do. It seems to me that it's a no-duh that alcohol is the biggest factor in perception alterations when it comes to sexual interaction. But something we should note is that how it does seem to affect these low masculinity men the most when it comes to some potential latent distaste for women more than high masculine men, which is in complete opposition to what the article postulates. High masculine men are generally unaffected by alcohol when it comes to their interactions with women. But that doesn't mean that alcohol is somehow less to blame. I have to ask, can't we just be kind of honest with ourselves that liquid courage is probably way more likely to result in liquid assault than any other variable? To me, that doesn't seem odd. Alcohol makes people make bad decisions. I think we all know that. So, in conclusion, this is a weak as hell article, with the only supportive study that it uses relying upon a practice of fact. Thus, in conclusion, we have no evidence for the statements made in the headline of this article, and it's why you should always read this kind of stuff really carefully. Because if you don't go in and actually look at the science, it's very easy to pull the wool over your eyes. 
I have cited everything that I have talked about today in the description down below, as I always do. If you feel like supporting me in any way you see so fit, I have a Patreon, I also have a Subscribestar, and I am now signed up for Dick Masterson's payment processor. You don't have to do anything, but anything does help. My dear friends, thank you so much for watching this. All ton of volts. Doing a little experiment tonight to see what will get me drunker. Drinking wine. Or not drinking wine. Right now, drinking wine. Welcome to the bar. Can I get you a drink? <laughs> blame it on the Henny, blame it on the goose. Got you feeling dizzy. Blame it on the a a a a alcohol. Blame it on the a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a